hopefully we're going to have uh, give you something that you, you haven't necessarily seen as of yet. So um, let me just share my screen with everybody. Okay. Right, so hopefully everyone can see uh, this at the moment. Um, so I'll just get this started for you. Rightio. So thanks everybody for, for joining um, this talk about um, the integration of um, the herd of European bison in West Bleen um, and also their uh, key impacts um, up to uh, you know, this moment in time. So give you an idea of the timeline that we've been working, working with. Um, so the matriarch uh, arrived last year um, on the 8th of, of July and um, was uh, closely followed by the two younger females about a, a week later. We then had a, a lovely surprise um, as we were joined by uh, a calf on the, um, uh, the 11th of September. And then finally, to complete the set, um, the uh, bison bull arrived just before Christmas um, so that was a lovely, uh, lovely end to the year. And that gives us the founda foundation uh, block um, for, for the herd going forward. And um, hopefully this will grow organically over the, uh, the, the coming years. So just gonna give you a little bit of background on the, um, the individuals within the herd, because they're very distinctive in their personalities and their roles within, um, within the structure. So uh, we start with the matriarch, of course. Um, she's the uh, the leader of the herd. She's sort of the, the top dog, if you will. Um, she's a lovely animal. She came to us from Highlands Wildlife Park in Scotland. She's 18 years of um, uh, years old, um, and you know she's a calm, patient, and experienced individual. Um, everything she does is is key for the herd. You know, um, her influence is is vital to their survival and to them thriving. Um, so uh, everything that she does as well, it permeates through to the rest of them. So that calm and patient um, personality is really good because it obviously, um, you know, uh, it reflects well um, for, for the others. And it means that um, they pick up on that and it means that collectively they're less um, sort of skittish and nervous as a result. So we were blessed by, by um, you know, being uh, given um, uh, this individual in particular. And what's interesting is she actually came to us. She wasn't a matriarch in her previous herd in, um, in Scotland, but she's come to us and, um, you know, that experience and that age has really set her apart from, from the young, um, younger females. And um, she's taken to the, the task beautifully. So we're extremely lucky to have her. Moving on to the bull, um, so he's, uh, he's an impressive specimen, as you can see. He came to us from Suburburg Zoo in Germany. He's a lot younger, he's four years of, of age. Um, and, and so far, his character has quite come on sort of quite um, uh, pronounced um, since he's, he's uh, arrived. Initially, he was... Tom, I think you might have just muted yourself there. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. Apologies. I, I hope you haven't me. missed too much. Um, um, yeah, sorry. So he's, um, he, you know, he, he was very cautious and shy to begin with. Um, but we're seeing this inner resilience and, and a toughness to him. Um, and, he's, and he's incredibly perceptive as well. He really watches you. Um, as you can see in the, in the first image on the left, he's very attentive and uh, he clocks you, whereas the rest of the herd might um, sort of drop their guard and go about their way. He's always watching and, and, and very um, yeah, perceptive and aware of his surroundings, which is really good. He's, he's an, he plays an important role within the herd structure. So we want that. Um, another really cool thing about the bull is that he actually um, has uh, a, a you know, really good genetic lineage to the sort of the founding um, ancestors of, of all European bison, you know, all 9,000 odd um, that we, we have today. Um, and he has this uh, excellent lineage um, back to those uh, 12 individuals. So in that regard, he's fantastic. He's really going to be important for the breeding program, not just here in the UK, but obviously elsewhere in, in Europe, when potentially we do look to move animals on. Um, we're talking a few years, obviously, until that happens, but it's, it's a real boon for the project and we're excited to, to what he brings to the table.
So uh, moving on to, to female ones. So uh, one of our two younger females, um, she uh, came from Photo Wildlife Park in, in Ireland. Uh, she's also four years uh, four years old, and she's a, a quite shy um, and, and uh, you know um, a reserved character in, uh, early on. Again, we've seen a development in her character, but she tends to uh, in, in the past have been on the periphery on, of the group. Um, but she's incredibly inquisitive. Um, she's uh, often one of the ones that will you know if there's a new uh, smell or a new sort of um, sound or, or something you know she's very um very curious and will go to investigate um and she's incredibly protective of of the herd as well she shows really good um sort of protective and maternal instincts um and she's really started to take on some great um uh, responsibility within the herd so here we have uh female two uh, who is the other half from um, from Fota in Ireland, also four years of age. Um, she's uh, an interesting character. She's she's more persistent, um, especially when there's food involved. Um, quite assertive. Um, she's uh, she's not backwards at coming forward. She's certainly good at um, laying her claim to 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 you know to the food and and where she stands within uh, the, the the herd. And she can be quite feisty as well. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. It's good to see that um, that she's exhibiting those good wild behaviours that you, you want in, uh, you know, a free roaming herd of bison. And so here we have uh, uh, the calf. Um, obviously, she was born in the West Berlin, so that was a, a fantastic milestone for the project and everybody involved with the, um, uh, you know, the, the team and, and on the project. She's about six months of age, uh, old um, at the moment. Um, on the left hand image, you can see when she, uh, you know, as a newborn, she has that kind of caramel uh, coloured um, coat of fur and uh, very thin legs. You know, she was a bit like Bambi on ice um, initially. Plus, you can see over her shoulders, she just doesn't have that kind of archetypal um, bison uh, physique just yet. Fast forward a couple of months, the central picture, you can see now she's starting to, to lose some of that sort of baby colouring, starting to darken, and you can see in her face in particular that was really prominent early on. Um, you can just about make out either side of her head as well, two little budding um, uh, you know, horns coming through, so that's uh, just on the cusp of, of, of you know, those coming um, and being noticeable. And then uh, fast forward another three months, you can see in the, the far right image, she's starting to look like a proper little bison uh, almost on uh you know um you know the, the difference is is, is astounding and um, almost like they're different animals at this point so you've got those really prominent horns now you can see the muscle definition and the mash that she's put on particularly around her shoulders um and along uh, you know um her, her spine and she's a really powerful little individual now um almost uh, uh, you know similar size to her mum not miles off and um, you know, definitely starting to build up confidence and become, you know, part of the herd. Another just quick, nice example of you know the difference when she was born. You know, weighed roughly about thirty kilograms. You can see she could fit under mum um, there um, early days. And then uh, right hand picture, you can see her now. Um, again, next, uh, you know, alongside mum, and uh, you know, probably coming in at around hundred kilograms, and she's, um, yeah, she's coming on and quite literally leaps and bounds. So she'll grow, um, you know, might get, uh, grow to be bigger than her mum. So um, she's got a quite a lot of, uh, you know, years ahead of her, whereas mum's probably got another year or so of of growing until she reaches her full um, full size. So that'll be interesting to see how, you know, how big she actually gets. So here's a lovely photo from from Don um, taken of the bison herd as they went out into what we call Wolfwood um, for the first time. So initially they started in a uh, in the soft release, which was a sort of quarantine area which allowed us to keep a close eye on them, and that uh, was about five hectares. Then um, in uh, in November, and um, we uh, deemed that the time was right to to let them start to explore this much larger space in Wolfwood in, in, in the enclosure, which is about fifty hectares. And what was really interesting to see was how they engaged with this space initially. We saw a similar thing happen when they um, they first arrived. They were concentrated in quite a small area where they felt comfortable and confident, and then they make these little forays out into the wider area. Uh, but returning um, after short periods back to that original spot. We opened the soft release and had three entrances. 
And after opening, they were using these three gateways as um, entry points into Wolfwood. Um, and we could see from the, the collar data that they were going off, you know, a couple of hundred meters and then returning again and using it as a base camp, building up that knowledge of, uh, you know, their new surroundings and building up that confidence. And we since, you know, have seen them in every corner, you know, tracks, um, evidence of them debarking um, everywhere within the, uh, you know, the, the enclosure now. So they're building that confidence. And obviously that will continue when the other enclosures uh, are opened up to them as well. So just give you a, a, a bit more background on the, the hierarchy and um, the, the evolution of the, um, you know, the roles that the, the animals are playing within the herd. So as we mentioned, the matriarch is, is the prominent figure. Um, the two younger females defer to the matriarch uh, upon um, arrival after uh, you know, a short period of, of trying to work out um, you know, who stands where within the, the hierarchy. Um, initially, the, the matriarch and female two, um, they bonded very quickly and strongly. And as I mentioned, female one was a bit more on the periphery and you know, a bit like a black sheep of the family. She was chased off the food and maybe didn't get as much as ten attention as, as female two was getting. So female two is, is slightly older than female one, only by a, a week or so. Um, and you know, she shows a, a more dominant personality, often chasing um, F1 off, uh, off food, particularly when um, you know, she, she was pregnant and, and feeding her calf. Um, looking back on that, you know, a, a big part of that is obviously the competition for food. Um, and she's going to be very defensive of, you know, obviously making sure that she has enough sustenance, not, not only for herself, but for, for the calf. But we have noticed the female one is, is standing up more for herself. So she seems to be kind of coming more into her own now, which is really uh, interesting to see and seeing how that dynamic is, is sort of changing over time. I've seen uh, of, of, of all the other individuals, um, uh, you know, female too um, can show some displeasure. You know, she's got that feisty, fiery streak to her um, and she will, uh, um, you know, display the archetypal uh, sort of bison disapproval um, uh, head movements uh, towards the matriarch. But she sort of shuts that down fairly quickly and she does that in a very calm but proportionate manner. She doesn't go over and above and beyond. Um, she just moves them on, um, if that's the case, and, uh, and, and makes pretty, you know, it, it well known that um, that she's the, you know, the, the top dog. Um, so, yeah, as I said, female one was, was very shy and wary to begin with. But she's now taking on this more prominent role within the group. She's grown in confidence um, and taking on extra responsibilities. She has a really uh, strong bond with the calf and she really keeps a close eye on her, making sure that she's, uh, you know, she's not strained too far from the herd um, that, uh, you know, she's getting plenty of attention sometimes when when mum's had enough of, of looking after the little one, she sort of steps in and, and really fulfills that role and helps grooming and, and just, yeah, like I said, being there and, and making sure that she's okay. She was very key in helping the bull to do assimilate, um, very attentive and, um, you know, uh, uh, approaching him, uh, grooming him and um, showing him a lot of tension and just helping him to bed in during that sort of slightly, um, you know, difficult opening uh, period. Um, and, and as a result, they, they also have uh, developed um, quite, a, quite a strong bond. And, and finally, she's also very proactive at defending the herd. She's often one of the first to face up a potential threat, which is, is great. Um, initially, when the bull arrived, um, he was quite, uh, like I said, a quite shy and nervous animal. This sort of rubbed off on the females. We did notice a change in their personality, uh, their behavior. Um, uh, initially, but they've still all since sent, uh, settled down. Since the bull has uh, has again grown more confident um, and started to establish himself more, um, we've noticed that the females, as a result, have also have calmed back down again, which is is fantastic to see. Uh, initially, loud noises, sudden movements, and the presence of people um, would would cause the flight syndrome, and he would just bolt for the tree line. And often we wouldn't see him again for hours and hours. So um, he's really come on um, since that, those um, you know moments early on. And now he's uh, shown a lot of authority and assertiveness within the herd. Uh, again, especially when it comes to, to facing threats, he'll face them up. And, and you know, that's his role within the herd. Well, one of his roles within the herd is obviously to offer protection. So it's really good to see him starting to understand where he stands um, and, and what his, you know, what his function is within the herd, other than obviously, obviously the breeding. 
who often cajole the young females um, if the matriarch is moving on and they're sort of being a bit stubborn and a bit slow, he, he will often come back and, and again sort of help to move them on. So it's really great to see him, um, yeah, uh, sort of growing into his role within the herd. Uh, I've seen multiple failed attempts. In fact, we saw um, a few sort of interesting, uh, you know, um, uh, moments today where he's he's sort of uh, approaching the females. Um, he's looked to, to mount them a few times, um, but unsuccessfully. Um, and, and this has been occurring outside of rutting season. So it, it's going to be interesting to see, uh, you know, um, come come sort of the uh, autumn um, time when we expect the, the rutting season. You know whether or not he's developed those skills and um you know if he uh you know he knows what he's doing at that point at the moment he looks like he hasn't quite worked it out so uh, it's going to be yeah going to be interesting he's quite young you know it, it, realistically we'd expect them uh, a male bull to to make from probably about the age of you know six years of age so he's quite young he's still learning the ropes um but he is sexually active so in theory you know we could have uh calves um you know maybe not this year but, but next year, um, uh, fingers crossed. So the calf is also starting to develop these necessary skills um, for survival in the wild. She's really starting to um, display the behavioral traits uh, that the adults do. So all the debarking, uh, dust bathing, she's been eating solids for quite a while now as well, which is, is uh, good to see. And, um, you know, rubbing up against trees as well. She's still suckling with mum, um, and we'd expect that to go on for, for, you know, probably another six months or until another calf was on the scene. Um, initially, uh, we weren't too sure about the um, F2's maternal instincts. Sometimes she would leave the calf alone and that's when female one would come in and, and fulfill that role and make sure that she didn't get forgotten. Um, a few times when uh, the calf came to suckle that she would, uh, you know, chase um, uh, the calf off or um you know uh, actually kick out at her but looking back on it it was most likely because once she's still getting used to the the sort of the process um feeding time you know she's obviously having to to uh, you know eat for two um so she really needs to focus on getting um you know the food and sustenance um and and also the calf can be quite aggressive when she's going in to suckle so um the the, the other thing was we thought you know th that she was actually hurting um female too but actually um they come on and they found a compromise the calf doesn't bother or harass female too now when uh, she's feeding she knows that's uh, not the time to go um to go in for milk so she's learned that and and the bond is, is much stronger now and you can see f2 is very attentive um to towards the calf and finally we've seen lots of bonding occurring between the herds so we've seen lots and lots of instances of, of grooming sort of gentle sparring vocalizing and, and ruminating together so here we have the bull, um, uh, when he, he arrived, this is the moment when um, the herd are meeting him for the first time. As you can see, female one is on the left here, um, and the bull is second to uh, to the left. Uh, female one's straight in there, that inquisitiveness. She wants to to find out what is this, um, you know, this strange new, uh, you know, uh, bison bull that has been introduced. She's just establishing and, and smelling him. He, you can see, is, is a bit unsure. He's just come off the, the end of a long journey, um, uh, you know, uh, in the back of a trailer from Germany. So obviously he's got a new home. He's, uh, there's so much going on. So he's a little bit, a little bit shy. Um, the matriarch at this point is sort of taking stock of, of the situation and just sort of moves in and is just, just gauging. And female two in the calf are, are kind of curious, but just holding back a little bit. just coming up it's quite quite funny to see that uh, basically female one is obviously uh, getting a little bit close maybe pestering the ball and he you know gives her the warning to say yep yeah, that's enough you've had enough of a, a sniff at this point could you leave me alone um but that's good you know again he's establishing boundaries <laughs> and then it's nice to see the difference between female one and, and the matriarch now comes forward and you see, she doesn't go straight up to him. She doesn't get into his personal space. She's just there sort of making her presence be known. 
um, without pushing or, or sort of triggering him. So again, that experience coming uh, coming to the fore there. Here we have some nice examples of, of herd bonding. So um, we have uh, this sort of playful, gentle sparring where, you know, the females and the, and, and the male will, um, you know, uh, will spar gently, often uh, over food, but, um, you know, it's a good way of, uh, you know, exploring that relationship and, and playfully sort of enacting, um, you know, what would, uh, would be otherwise quite an aggressive and powerful um, exercise. So it, this is them sort of developing and, and understanding that hierarchy and, and establishing who's strong and, uh, you know, um, where people stand within the herd. On the right hand side, you can see uh, female one and the matriarch, really nice to see um, them grooming one another and looking very happy in the um, sort of the autumn sun. Uh, what's really nice to see is that the, uh, that relationship has developed since those early days, and, and we do see now that the, the matriarch and, and sort of female one have got a very strong bond, and the grooming just reinforces that. The bottom left, it, again, female one and the calf, um, just having a lie down and, and ruminating. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the calf has a really you know, huge affection. She really looks up to female one, spends a lot of time with her. And I think a big part of that is the, the temperament of female one. She's very, very patient and she'll put up with a lot, whereas the others won't. Um, she does allow the, the calf to get away with quite a bit. So I think the calf obviously sees that and, and understands, you know, that this is, you know, somebody that, um, you know, cares for her. So often we'll sort of, you know, lie down very close to her. And um, yeah, it's, it's lovely to see that uh, she's taken under uh, her, her wing. And then on the, the bottom right here, we can see the herd together and the bull. He's, uh, you know, he's rubbing up against um, female two in this instance. Um, again, uh, you know, looking to, to, to develop that bond, scent marking and, um, you know, the close contact is, is another way of showing sort of affection. So he's possibly also looking um, at, uh, you know, at mounting uh, female two. Um, but in this instance, you know, the females are not in estrus, um, so weren't interested. So here is some of that sparring that we uh, we mentioned before. So if you were to compare this to males in, you know, in rut um, in the autumn, you know that's full-blooded and um you know uh quite quite aggressive this you know you can see there's no um malice um it's just um sort of playful gentle sparring and most likely because they're both feeding from the same same pile at this moment we'll have a quick look at some of the impacts that the bison have been having so one of the first things we noticed was debarking um, uh, throughout the soft release in particular, all of the tree species that we found in that area, um, the, the, the bison were going in and, and having a nibble. Um, on the left here, you can see a, a young oak um, sapkin. And uh, you can quite clearly see those teeth marks going up, uh, up the stem. Um, and what the bison do is they get their, um, you know, their teeth underneath the, the tree bark and the cambium, and they peel that off. And, um, and certain trees, um, you know, are, are, are easier than others. So a young oak, for example, is, 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 is perfect and it's on the menu. A mature um, oak tree, when you get that fissured, sort of thicker tree bark, um, we, we haven't seen any impacts on those because um, it's, you know, it's, it's unpalatable and it's a much harder, um, you know, surface to work through. The silver birch was, um, early days, was one of the most um, sort of popular trees. Um, and we noticed over time when they started to pick out things like the oak, willow, aspen and sweet chestnut, that actually debarking dropped on the silver birch. But um, they continued to uh, defoliate um, the birch wherever possible. Um, on the right hand side, you can see an example of a willow that has been completely stripped bare. And, and what's interesting about the, the willow is um, because of the, the salicylic acid that is found um, you know, within the bark, which is also um, used in the, the production of, of, of aspirin. So it looks like the bison are self-medicating and they have this innate um, understanding of what is, um, you know, what resources are available to them um, and, and how to attribute them to, to certain things. So we'll have a look later as well at rhododendron, which is another interesting example of where they use it for, um, to benefit them in, uh, throughout the course of the year. 
sweet chestnut. So this is possibly one of their, their favorite um, um, trees. It, it's also one of the most common um, in, in the enclosure. Um, but uh, on the left hand side, it's really nice to see that they're not just targeting young, um, young trees, they will go for mature ones as well. So this is probably about 30 centimeters in diameter and um, they've really gone to town on, on the tree. What's nice as well is this tree won't necessarily die. It's not a case of um, you know, killing the tree off, which obviously creates excellent stand in deadwood habitat. What you also get is it, it, it almost mimics the coppicing um, technique and you'll get this basal reed growth if they have managed to ring bark the tree. Um, and it will it essentially it acts um, you know, as coppicing and that creates this structure within the woodland, which is what we're looking for. Different age, um, ages within uh, you know, the, the structure and different heights. And that is really important to, to the woodland. The central picture is a younger tree, um, a young sweet chestnut, um, totally ring barked. And you can see that the, the, the tree, um, sorry, the leaves are sort of disheveled and, and brown. Um, so that now will, will again, um, in theory, die off. It'll be interesting to see whether it does uh, sprout from the base again or whether it's left as a standing deadwood. And then on the right here is a fantastic example of how proficient they are at debarking. You can see that uh, it starts right at the base of the tree and it goes up nearly five to six meters up, um, up the stem. And uh, what, they, what they do is they get their teeth under um, that, uh, that bark and they pull it off like, like streamers. Um, and then um, they sit there chewing their way through it. And uh, sweet chestnut in particular, it seems to be a particular um, favorite of theirs for this reason, because it seems like you get more bang for your buck, uh, sort of minimum effort, uh, particularly on a, a slightly younger tree like this one. Um, and they get a lot of, uh, um, you know, sustenance out of that. So here we have the matriarch uh, exhibiting some nice deep barking, working her way up the tree. Pretty sure this is one of the birch trees um, quite early on, but uh, you can see that bottom jaw, the teeth, trying to work, get underneath some perches under the bark to then strip it off. So not only do they um, they debark, but also part of their foraging behavior is, is browsing. Um, and, and defoliating. So where on the left hand side, we have some young goat willow. Um, sorry, it's not the clearest image, but basically they've kind of cropped that at about half a meter and then they've moved on and, and, um, and left it. So, you know, again, they haven't plucked it, um, uh, you know, uh, stripped it bare. That will continue to grow and, and feed into that sort of that, that interesting structure that we want within in the woods. We also seen um, this continue throughout um, the winter and they moved away from things like willow, which when it was in leaf, um, they seem to target really uh, heavily. During the winter, young willow trees, they've left completely alone. Whereas they moved on to things like oak and, and uh, eating the, the sort of the terminal buds um, on there and trying to find those sources of, of uh, nutrients in those leaner winter months. Bramble is, as well is another, um, uh, you know, key food source for them in the winter. So we've noticed a definite increase in their um, browsing and, and grazing of, um, of that. Here we see um, uh, aspen. Um, so uh, when you get aspen, you often get uh, this, these flushes of, of aspen where the parent tree sends out rhizomes. So all of these um, trees that you see on the right hand image will be uh, genetically similar to uh, the, the same to the parent tree. Um, and what that does is um, it, it's fantastic because what it means is the bison can come in here and have a big impact and they cleared probably, uh, you know, a, a decent sized area where, um, you know, it looks like it's quite devastating. But hopefully what will happen is they'll move on to other areas now and that will continue to sort of uh, sucker and those rhizomes will grow again and you'll get young, um, uh, you know, aspen coming through as a result. And it's one of those tree species that responds well to grazing pressure. Uh, similar to things like willow. So actually, even though it looks like it can be quite devastating, these will respond very well um, to those pressures. Um, and again, it feeds into that keyword, the structure of the woodland. But you can see that this stem, probably about five centimetres across, um, six centimetres across, and they've made um, short business of it. They have snapped it off near the base there, almost at a right angle. And again, the right hand image shows you all of those trees leaning off, uh, you know, about a 45 degree angle is the work of the bison. 
trying to get at those leaves, stripping the trees bare. Um, and as a result, you can see in the foreground that lovely light filtering down to the ground. You can see the dense uh, sort of silver birch in the background and how shady that is in comparison. So here's female one giving us a, a exhibit in a nice case of getting the tree. You know, she can see that this is looking fresh, green and tender. How do I get it down? Often they'll try and get it between their two forelegs and work it along their, their, their front of the chest and the neck. In this case, she's, um, yeah, she's sort of uh, very obstinately saying, I'll do this with my, my face, um, but she does manage to, to get it down. And then a lovely buffet is her reward. And what's also nice about this is some of the trees, you know, that you've seen will snap um, and um, will then become sort of brash mats and, and sort of decompose on the ground. But others will just spring back. Once they're finished, the tree will, will you know, spring back into its uh, former position and continue to grow. So rubbing, um, lots of examples of, um, you know, really good uh, trees that are just at the right angle, just at the right height. So the bison frequent them and use them as, as rubbing and scratching posts. Um, you know, one to scratch, find places, you know, that they can, they can scratch um, and get rid of that itch in awkward positions and other times to slew off their winter fur. Um, so on the left, you can see uh, one of the um, Corsican pines. The left hand side of the tree has got a red hue and the right hand side um, is, is sort of greyish. And, and you can see those kind of flakes, those classic flakes you get on, on sort of conifers um, on Corsican pine. And the left hand side is where the bison have been rubbing up against and the, the no natural oils in their, in their fur has kind of um, sort of almost polished and buffed this side of the tree. And over time, they'll continue to rub um, and expose that heartwood, which then opens the tree up to, um, you know, potential fungi, fruit and bodies, wood boring insects, um, and creates that lovely standing deadwood habitat that we, um, that sadly is not as common as it should be in our, our woodlands. And then on the right hand side, you can see um, some clumps of fur left behind by this rubbing. So it's not just conifers that they uh, they target. This is a, a nice example of a, a, an amazing canker on the size the side of a uh, silver birch, perfect height again. And you can see on the right, you know, the the um, amalgamations of, of bison fur that they've left behind. We haven't seen this. Uh, well, I haven't I haven't seen this uh, um, as of yet. Uh, you know, birds actually coming in to use the the bison fur to insulate their nests. But there's a really interesting um, uh, you know case study in Kransflark, um research that went into uh, birds using it to line and incubate uh, their nests. And there was you know um, interesting findings to suggest that it acted as a much better uh, incubator. And, and as a result, um, you had a much more successful, um, you know, uh, ratio of, of hatchings. So interesting to see how, whether the birds pick up on this um, and, and, you know, what percentage of their nests may be used, uh, may use bison fur in the future. Uh, and here's just an example of some, uh, some scratching. Obviously we take it for granted having arms and opposable thumbs, you can scratch almost anywhere. Obviously for a bison, that's not quite so easy. So uh, a nice example of, of the impacts of the bison, on the left here, you can see um, one of the trees, one a sweet chestnut that's been debarked. So already we're seeing more light filtering down to the ground, but also lots of bracken, um, rhododendron, um, bramble, that kind of just creates this sort of, um, you know, obstruction to, to the ground. And on the right, you can see just how quickly the bison, in the space of a month, they're trampling, they're um, going in, they're horning um, the, the, the bushes, they're, um, they're knocking things over, and you've got a much lighter, more open um, glade as a result. And what's really interesting is when they've trampled things like bracken, it almost um, turns it into a mulch, which then in turn obviously feeds uh, the soil. So it, almost everything that you can see, you know, is, is uh, the, um, the work of the bison and, and everything that they're doing is having this positive impact. A nice example of, of um, uh, you know, a, a track, uh, a ride that they're, they're opening up, pushing those edges back and again, allowing that light to, to filter down to the ground. 
and the right hand side was uh, an early example um, where we noticed that the bison, the, the herd, targeted um, this little cluster of willows um, and they were doing the figure of eight horning um, uh, behavior, um, you know, weaving these trees almost uh, into like a, a weave. Some of them were literally threaded together um, in the process, trampling the ground. And you can see the light again, filtering down and, and touching the, the, the deck here. So again, that was in the space of, uh, you know, a, a couple of weeks that they managed to open this area up. We've also noticed that, uh, so of all the, um, the plants and vegetation um, that we find in um, uh, the enclosure, that we've noticed the bison um, eating um, everything that they find, whether that's uh, bracken, rhododendron, heather, um, periwinkle, they have sampled everything. It's a bit like a bison tapas. They really um, are showing great confidence in, in learning what foodstuffs are out there, what they should eat at what times of year, um, and here we can see they're almost using the, the heather like a brush, trying to get rid of those pesky, pesky flies. So another key um, behavior of the bison is, is their dust bathing. Um, so on the left here, you can see one of their, their frequently used dust bathing sites. Um, it's one of the larger ones, you know, uh, all told, there's, these are um, scattered across the enclosure. So some of them are, are larger and uh, more established like this one, and others are more, um, uh, you know, temporary um, and, and, and smaller. And that's the really interesting thing about the dust bathing sites. Some of them they'll continue to use, they'll get bigger and more permanent, and other ones they'll neglect and forget about. Um, and what you have is then these emerging communities that are then associated with those different um, you know, size and, and um, you know, the stage at which those dust baths are, these communities moving in. So they're a really important site for hunting invertebrates. Um, you know, the, the geology of the bling is, is very interesting. You've got the London clays with, um, you know, these seams of, of sandy um, uh, conglomerates. And as a result, this is perfect for things like uh, solitary mining bees can then use this disturbed, looser uh, material that we see. Um, as time goes, uh, if it continues to be used, um, it will be kept open. But the ones that are neglected, then you have these um, uh, plant communities moving in that are less competitive. They've got this excellent opportunity and window where they can then, um, you know, germinate and uh, and have an opportunity to grow. Whereas normally they'd be outcompeted by your brackens and brambles and, and whatnot. The right hand side, it, it, you can see there's this sort of rise, this bump, and this is where um, we get a lot of the wind throw of particularly the, the conifers where they get blown over. The, the root balls um, are upturned, displacing again all of that soil. And again, it's a fantastic place for the bison to scent mark, to rub the underside of their chin. Um, and, and as a result, you can see often the bison will come out and they'll have clay and sand clumped all around their face. So you know that they've been in somewhere, dust bathing and, and having a good rub. A nice example of the, the, the matriarch, dust bathing. And uh, the bison will do this um, to clean essentially and, and to remove parasites um, in their fur. They don't um, wallow or, or go into water in the same way that domestic cattle do. Um, they tend to just use it as a, as a you know, a drinking um, resource um, and then move on. So these open areas are really important for them to, to sort of stay clean and, like I said, remove any um, parasites in the process. Uh, just quickly uh, touch on this poaching and ground disturbance. Uh, the left hand image is in one of the conifer uh, areas. And what you see is uh, this sort of in impenetrable um, uh, layer of uh, pine uh, needles that then settle, build up, and they create almost like a thatch. And this um, prevents, again, those sort of less competitive species from, from uh, basically breaking through. Um, so it is a big obstruction. And you can see on the left, just that disturbance, you know, the bison coming through, uh, trampling and churning it up, that that allows seeds uh, to, to germinate and gives, um, you know, these less competitive species a chance to thrive. 
Similarly, on a uh, near the ponds, um, it's it's quite inter interesting to see, you know, how um, they're going to keep these open. And you'll have this sort of um, very fluid, um, you know, marginal communities growing around the ponds. Some areas will become more established, whereas others will be continue to be poached and kept open. And like I said, that's really important to create all these niches um, that otherwise just wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be prevalent. So we can't talk about the bison without talking about bison dung. Um, they do, <laughs> there's lots of it, um, but it's a fantastic resource for so many different things. Um, almost from day one, um, we noticed because the, the, the bison aren't dewormed and they don't have, you know, their, their dung is, is essentially just good organic um, waste. Um, uh, you know, dung beetles moving in, laying their eggs, um, and, and I've seen, you know, the larvae um, as a result of that. And then on the right image, you can see the peck holes of, um, you know, the birds that have learned about these grubs um, and, and larvae. And so obviously it's a really important source of food, not just for them, but for small, uh, small mammals as well. And um, not only that, but the, the, the bison dung as well, you know, it's a way of propagating seeds. We often find lots of seeds embedded into the dung. Um, so they're moving that and transporting that around the enclosure. Um, and it also just acts as a, as a mineral, you know, a, a nutrient bomb. So obviously they're really important, play a hugely important role within um, the ecosystem. Another really cool example, um, notice these uh, fungi and fruiting bodies on the dung quite early on. Um, even in um, uh, in summer, late summer. So, you know, dry conditions, we hadn't had a lot of rain, and yet the, you can see the dung is, is very moist and very wet, and it allowed the perfect growing conditions for fungi, probably outside the, the kind of the, the archetypal time frame. Um, so again, just another thing that they, they benefit. So also their impact on invasive and, and non-native species. So rhododendron, uh, rhododendron ponticum um, is, is a big problem in, in British woodlands. Um, it's, it's a bit of a thug. It, it grows in these big thickets and it just shades out the understory. Um, it's great to see that the bison are coming in and they're just going to town. They are um, trampling it. They are swishing their heads through. Um, and as I mentioned earlier with the willow, um, it, it looks like they used it as an insect repellent. The sap, when they break those stems, um, they rub it all around their fur and it helps to keep the, the pesky insects off them in the, the heat of summer. So again, they have this innate understanding of what the benefits of different species are, uh, are to them throughout, throughout the woods. So um, young uh, non-native conifers, it's quite interesting. They don't debark or eat the, uh, the conifers um, and uh, the young ones included. But what we have seen is this um, sort of playful engagement with the, the young uh, saplings um, and, and using it as a display of strength. They'll go in there and they'll horn and they'll you know, thrash about um, playing with the almost like the elasticity of the, 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 um, the trees. They seem to enjoy that. And then when it cracks, you know, it obviously gives off some, some satisfaction. So you often find these like clumps of fur right in the, uh, the you know, thicket of, um, of the tree. But what's really important about this is essentially the bison are impacting that successional generation of conifer. So whilst the larger trees are going to take a while for them to impact with the rubbing, what they're doing is they're actually going through and damaging the next generation um, and allowing the you know native broadleaf species to come through and and take their niche within the woodland so it's fantastic to see that they are having this impact and it's going to bear fruit hopefully within the sort of the next generation of, of trees and um, uh, you know woodland that we see coming through as a result just finally, just wanted to show you that, you know, it's not all destructive. Whilst it's an ongoing process, it might seem, you know, quite uh, a bit like a bulldozer and going in and thrashing and trashing the, the site. But actually, you know, it's part of a long term process. Um, and, and like I said, you know, it isn't all, all destructive per se. On the left, we have um, one of the redwood wood ant nests, really impressive one in this case but you can see the track just to the right of it where the bison they circumnavigate it and they'll walk around that initially we weren't sure are they going to go right through it and, and not bat an eyelid are they going to nose around um you know they've got a bit of a bite the ants and they spray formic acid so we thought maybe maybe not but um there actually can be very um you know uh gently um trodden you know they will go around these areas and, and leave places intact so again not all destructive 
And the one on the right, sorry, it's probably not very clear what I've tried to show you here, but again, that disturbance in the, um, the, the, the pine needle thatch, and we can just see a sprig of, of heather coming through that has, as a, as a result of that disturbance, has been able to push through and um, it offers, you know, a nice um, sort of uh, hopeful glance into the future of what the bleem might look like. We might start to see, you know, heathy rides come uh, come to the fore more, you know, wood pasture style um, habitat start to develop. So it's a really exciting um, uh, moment in time. And, and like I said, it's only just starting. This is the beginning of, of, of everything. So it's going to be uh, fascinating to see how the continued uh, presence of the bison is going to have and shape you know, uh, uh, positively the, the the woodland around them. So thank you for all for listening. Um, I think now we can move to the the Q and A. Um, just stop that. Yes, thank you, Tom. That's really interesting. That's a pleasure. Sorry, got gone on probably a bit longer than than hoped, but um, <laughs> yes, please. Any questions? Fire away. Uh, oh, we've had one pop up in the chat. Pat has asked, I saw you provided hay for the herd. Do you still supplementary feed? Yes, good question. So, yes, we are uh, continuing to supplementary feed at the moment. So um, just to give people context, the reason we did that was um, when uh, the animals originally arrived um, on site, they came from um, places that they were supplementary fed. So they were they were used to having um, you know food put out for them new site they've got to learn what's safe to eat um you know what times of the year uh, the ebbs and flow of you know the vegetation cycles where are they going to feed so uh, the decision was made to continue that uh, supplementary feeding um we were starting to wean them off uh late summer and then the calf arrived so that kind of put things on a bit of a back burner so we um we continued to feed because mum needed to to obviously um keep up her her health and um, condition for for not just for herself but for the calf and then the bull uh, arrived and he he came to us uh underweight um so we were a little bit concerned about his his um his condition so we again decided that it's winter it's their first winter in a new site we're going to continue to supplementary feed and that has continued now they're all in excellent condition and whilst the feed obviously forms an important part of their uh, their feeding sort of regime they forage probably getting on for sort of you know 70 percent of their overall diet um, if not more comes from them going out and sourcing their own food so it's not to say that we're just feeding them and it's it's like a zoo you know it's just to make sure that they get through that first difficult winter um, and we're looking to start to phase them off that now hopefully with the um the idea to just allow them to to forage that for themselves and they've got a winter behind them so who knows next winter we hope that they um we won't have to intervene Thank you. Um, John has asked, do we think that there is a limit to the number of bison that the woods can sustain? So we have a license for 20, uh, 20 animals. Um, it's hard to say what the stocking density is for them in this particular habitat, because across Europe, they, uh, you know, bison are found in a, a wide sort of variety of habitats. Um, I would say, yeah, probably 15 to 20 for when they have the run of the 200 hectares. Yeah, 15 to 20 probably seems like a, a, a good number, but obviously that's going to be very much of a, um, you know, an emerging science, you know, how uh, some years we're going to have drought, some years we're going to have floods, you know, that's going to impact the, the, the food sources in, in turn. So we might see natural fluctuations within what the landscape can sustain. Um, and that's all going to feed into, um, you know, our understanding of, of stocking densities and, you know, especially in sites where you have um, semi free roaming herds, um, you know, you have to be very careful to, to, to look at that relationship between the herd and um, the site and that they're not overgrazing because obviously we don't want to go to the opposite end of the extreme. So um, it's going to be interesting, but yeah, 15 to, to, to 20 probably is, is an ideal number for, for West Bleen. Uh, Sarah has asked, has there been any interaction or reactions with the horses or pigs yet, or are they not yet together? Um, so, um, yes, so, uh, the, the bison and the pigs um, uh, were, were in the same enclosure and um, the bison, it, it was very interesting to see because the bison obviously were establishing their, their dominance over, over the pigs. Um, so uh, they were chasing them around and um, yeah, making sure that, that the pigs knew 
who um, was was top of the food chain, as it were. Um, so, yes, it, it's been interesting to see, um, you know, how these relationships develop. The ponies aren't in there at the moment, so we are going to wait to see how um, that one um, moves along um, in terms of we probably need more space, more food to be available, because at the moment, there's probably not enough to introduce three Exmoor ponies into the same enclosure. So once those tunnels go in, we'll probably see the rest, you know, of, of the grazing assemblage move into, um, into that space. But, but the pigs have the free roam of the site, so they can get in and out of the enclosure. So, um, yeah, we fully intend that that's going to be, be the case. Thank you. Um, Jasper has said, how thoroughly has the diversity of insect and fungi and plants between surveyed before the bison's arrival? And is there an ongoing monitoring of the area? I think that sounds like a Cora question. Might be fair to Cora like on you. That one. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, there is definitely um, monitoring happening. We have a very, very extensive monitoring program for the Bleen um, that encompasses most things that you could possibly think of. First and foremost, um, vegetation and invertebrates. So there is a, a, a really large vegetation monitoring going on every summer where we look at any vegetation data uh, uh, under the sun. Um, and that is repeated every year. Um, the same goes for invertebrate abundance. So we're looking at um, how many of each invertebrate group we have. Um, so how many bees, how many flies, how many bugs and beetles. Um, and then every five years, we also do invertebrate diversity surveys. So they go more into depth and, and look at, at the diversity across the site. Um, in terms of fungi, um, they're not part of the vegetation monitoring, but we do soil eDNA analysis that looks at fungi in particular, as well as bacteria. I'm going to skip ahead because Thomas has also asked something similar. Have we had any, um, uh, you said it might be a bit soon, but now spring is arriving. Have we been surprised by the arrival of any new species? Um, so ever since the bison arrived, we haven't done um, any vegetation monitoring. So that is going to start in May again, as well as most other uh, monitoring, to be fair. Um, so uh, if Tom and Don have seen anything exciting, I don't know. But in terms of what has been recorded through the monitoring programme, we haven't started this year's yet. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to say uh, make the correlation to the bison and such. I mean, we've seen some really cool um you know species out there uh you've seen uh, goshawk for example which i don't think had been sighted as far as i'm aware in in the bleen before um lesser spotted woodpeckers things like that so i, I wouldn't want to test you know uh, that to the the bison and their behaviors yet but in turn hopefully the continued presence of the bison will benefit sort of species like that but yeah as cora said and, and thomas said i think probably the coming years are going to show that in uh you know in, in greater light Thank you. Um, Mark has asked, has the matriarch had any calves herself? She has. I think she's had, um, I think it's six or seven. So she she has, yes, yeah, she's been through the process before and um, she knows the drill. Um, she's been there and got the T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And Mary has asked, um, at what age will the calf be able to breed? Um, so um, probably from the age of about four, um, realistically, that's when um, she'll she'll potentially bear bear a calf as well. Um, but uh, you know, it could be um, you know slightly before that or slightly after that. But uh, yeah, normally four is sort of the sexual maturity for for females. Uh, Susan has asked, when will the eco bridges be open and best time to visit? Oh, the million dollar question, literally. I think <laughs> um, how expensive these bridges going to be but um no i think um uh realistically we're probably looking at the end of the year um for all of the bridges to be in place it might be um that come you know the summer that there's a couple uh you know in in place um so i would say probably trying to visit in the summer would be a good time um but for all of the enclosures to be open i think we're probably looking end of this year realistically before that um, that's the case but uh, obviously when they are in, in place they're going to offer an incredible vantage point to to see the bison from um, and that's going to greatly increase hopefully the chances of seeing them because at the moment 
uh, you know, you can walk around the entire uh, perimeter of um, of Wolfwood where the bison are. But um, if the bison are in the interior, you know, they could be hundreds of meters from the fence line. And even in the winter, uh, you know, Don and I could be in there and they could be sometimes 10 meters away. And you wouldn't know um, unless you hear them and, and sometimes smell them um, because they're like shadows in the night. It, they can be so quiet and they blend so incredibly well into their surroundings. So um, I would say probably summertime, hopefully when, when we've got a couple of tunnels maybe in place. Thank you. Um, Alexandra said, regarding animals which have naturally died, are you able to leave these on site away from public eyes or is this illegal? If you are not able to, do you have an idea of the appetite UK regulatory bodies have to allowing this in the future? It's a very um, apt question, really, because um, uh, there's a group, uh, the Large Herbivore Working Group, um, who are currently looking at legislation associated with things such as this, um, leaving carcasses and um, you know the fallen uh, fallen rule. So um, yes, at the moment, no, we can't leave um, uh, you know anything that's classified as as domestic that would have to be removed. So if a bison was to to, to die, we would have to to take that off site um, um, because it is a legal requirement. Um, yeah, so th these these groups are working to challenge that because obviously carcasses are a hugely important part of a naturally functioning ecosystem for, for carrion and and for uh, you know just a myriad of other species. Um, so we need them in our landscapes. Um, in terms of what the regulatory bodies, um, uh, yeah, is it, I'd say there's probably individuals within uh, these uh, these organisations that yes, that probably do see. Um, see the benefits and, and want to help drive that change but at the moment it's it's fairly entrenched the the mindset of you know you just remove an animal um because we're not used to large wild herbivores and and okay whilst we we classify the, the bison as being wild technically they fall under d the domestic license um which sadly there's no leeway there's no kind of grayish area in in that um to allow us to leave them so we we'd have to remove them but we are working on it and it is something that um touch wood in the the, the future that we will see carcasses being left because like i said it's it's very important thank you juliet has asked what species are you expecting to begin growing within the bleen due to the bison's impact um well, I, I, I'd say, again, it's hard to know specifically, uh, maybe for the, the, the baleen, a nice example is obviously the, the broadleaf species, so maybe more um, rare tree types, you know, like a uh, wild surface tree, um, things like, you know, hornbeam, which doesn't make up a huge amount of the site, um, beech as well, we might see more of them coming through um, because they have the space to, to, to grow. Um, a, a nice example would be something like the common cow wheat, which is an important food plant for the heath fritillary, which is a really iconic species of the baleen um, because it's so um, so uh, nationally rare. Um, so, you know, in terms of the bison uh, creating, it, it's also known as the woodman's follower. You know, it follows where the traditionally coppicing would have occurred um, and the heath fritillary needs that food plant and, and predominantly when it's in the sun. So we have a lot of cow wheat, but in shaded areas. And you notice the difference between, um, yeah, cow wheat that is on a ride, bask, you know, bathing in, 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 basking in the sun compared to that in the shade. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not, you know, the bison propagating, you know, eating the cow wheat and, and propagating it elsewhere, but also opening up that, um, that dense sort of canopy um, will have a positive impact on, you know, the heath fertility. But, um, but yes, in, in terms of it going forward, you know, there's a lot of uh, key species that we might start to see moving in from mainland Europe um, that as we, uh, you know, the, the site, um, you know, uh, it becomes more resilient and, and, you know, the bison helped it to adapt to changing climate um, and whatnot. We might see, you know, interesting species coming from from abroad, um, things like Dartford warbler and, and, and whatnot. So, um, uh, those are sort of some off the top of my head that I think we, we, we might see benefit from, from the bison. Thank you. Um, Susan has asked, is there just one elk? Um, I think, uh, I'm assuming that's for wild words. Um, and um, no, if that is the case, it, there's two now. 
um, Jürgen and Caramel, and they are mingling together and um, hopefully love is in the air um, that we may get, yeah, get lucky um, and see some young elk uh, in the near future. But, um, but yeah, at the moment it's, it's too in Wildwood. There's none in the Bleen that I know of. I hope there isn't because <laughs> otherwise that's got, gone under the radar. Um, thank you from Jasper. John has said, will the pigs be allowed out in the open like the horses and cattle currently are? Yes. Yeah. So like I said, the pigs um, will be the only um, conservation grazers that can move freely between both areas. Um, so, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're very intelligent. They um, already work in ways to get under the electric fence. So, yeah, no doubt that they um, that they will work out how to get into the the uh you know the cattle and um pony area as well so it's only a matter of time yeah uh leslie has asked whether a herd of 15 to 20 hopefully will the bull calf stay with the herd or will they get moved to other herds so uh, yeah uh, um uh sorry the bull calves um yes yeah, so they will uh, basically will have to move them on before they reach sexual maturity because of the the risk of inbreeding um, so normally we would look to move them on before the age of, of about um, about four, especially if um, the, the alpha bull is, is in the herd. Um, you know, ideally between two to four, we'd look to move these animals on. The great thing is, like I mentioned earlier, because, um, you know, the bull has got this fantastic uh, pedigree, they won't be in short demand. So these bulls will then be part of the European breeding program for European bison. And there'll be a huge, uh, you know, interest in these these bulls. So whilst they they won't stay um, with the herd beyond that 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 time frame, and um, they'll go on to you know um, to do amazing work uh, on sort of sister sites throughout Europe. And then final question: um, Joanne has asked, why is bare ground preferred, like the paths being made? So I wouldn't say it's necessarily preferred. It's it's just um, when we talk about sort of resilience within natural environments, you want as many different types of habitats in, a, you know, in an area as possible. So the bare ground in a lot of, um, you know, in a lot of woodlands, we don't get the disturbance because we don't have grazing animals other than maybe deer. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, you have, you know, things like the bramble and, and whatnot growing and leaf litter. Um, and it's just, it's just, it, like I said, it's important for to have as many different types of habitats and um, available to support as many different species as, as possible. Uh, and bare ground in this case is, like I said, it's, it's a fantastic hunting ground for, um, you know, hunting insects. Um, the green tiger beetle, for example, is one of our most uh, stunning um, insects here in the UK. And that will um, hunt, you know, it's it's like um, the equivalent of being hunted by a cheetah. They're so fast, but they need this open ground in order to, to hunt. Um, so that obviously creates a great place for them to hunt. Um, but also just, uh, like I said, less competitive sort of uh, plant communities that need space, light uh, to grow. And if you're competing with bracken, you, you're just never going to win that battle. Um, so as a result, it just gives them an opportunity to, you know, to germinate and to, to thrive. So it's not necessarily that we want everything to be bare ground. That's that's not what we're looking for. Um, it's just in areas that there is no bare ground, it's good to, to, to have. That's everything in the chat. Is Are there any other questions that anyone has? So feel free to shout them out. Um, can I just um, comment on, um, I think it was Jesper's last message. Um, he was asking if the monitoring um, results are going to be published anywhere accessible. Um, and there is a monitoring web page uh, that is accessible for everyone where we publish all of our findings. Um, so anyone can go and have a read and look at um, a bit more detail um, into anything that they might be interested in. I don't know if we can circulate that link, but it, it is online and it, I think it's easily findable if you just Google wildly monitoring yeah it's it's on the main Kent wildlife trust website um like you say if you search on there it's quite easy to find baleen stuff on the website not surprisingly <laughs> um, another message another thank you um are there any other questions
Right. Um, I think we'll leave it there then. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for, for joining everybody and hope to see you in the bleen soon. <laughs>